Hey, I'm Pastor Greg Surgeon, and I am so glad that you're able to join us this morning with our online service. And I just want to welcome you and thank you for allowing us to, to be in your home today. And you know, these times are troubled, and, and there's a lot of fear that can capture our hearts during this time of difficulty and trouble. But I want to encourage you today that there's great hope in Christ. God is on the throne. And we have a God that we can pray to and who is near to us during this time. So uh, during this time, I just want to encourage you in Christ and to lean on him because he's very near. Now, let me pray before we start into this morning's service. Father, we are thankful that you are our greatest hope. And you've promised us, Lord, that you would be near during these times. And so, Lord, I pray for every listener this morning or whenever they're listening. I pray that your strength and your peace would capture their mind and their hearts. Help us to look to you and to lean on you during this time. For the sake of Christ, we pray and in his name. Amen. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. 
night is holding on to me. God is holding on. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. It's not my life to live. It's not my song to see. And all I have is His for all eternity. It's not my righteousness. It's not my faithfulness. And all I have is His. all eternity and we will invite your attention to the gospel of Matthew chapter 21. Today is, um, today is the day that we celebrate the triumphal entry of Christ. This is Palm Sunday. And so I, I want us to look this morning and look in the scripture and look particularly in the gospel of Matthew. And I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 21 uh, verses 1 through 11. Now, 
when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus said to, to his two disciples, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, sitting on a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. And so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the coat and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who went before those and followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And so the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. We have four accounts, but one gospel. We have reliable historical records and more evidence of the last week of Jesus' life. And as we, as we look at this week that we call Holy Week or week of the Passion of Christ, this is the beginning of Palm Sunday where we are reminded that Jesus was entering Jerusalem and we know as the unfolding of the week comes along that Jesus will ultimately face a mock trial, crucifixion, and then be resurrected from the dead. The Gospel of Matthew gives us the kingly account of a Messiah, the King that is to come. Mark depicts Jesus as a servant, a servant who is moving to and fro in this world. And he declares that the greatest among you will be those who be the one who is a servant. Luke gives a, a, a straight record as a historian as well as a physician. Luke reminds us that Jesus, um, that, that Jesus is indeed come in fulfillment of the prophecies. And then the Gospel of John is rich in so much spiritual application and points us to Jesus as the great I Am, the Good Shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what's interesting out of the life of Christ is the last week of His life there's, there is more recorded evidence of the things that He did, what He said, and why is that, do you think? Well, it is because within this last week of his life was the culmination of why he came. You see, as we look at the life of Christ, it was this last week of his life plus his resurrection and the revealing of himself as the risen Christ that changed the whole trajectory of human history. There has not been a person alive on the face of this earth that has had more influence than the life of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, historians tell us this. Historians tell us that Jesus 
in his life affected how we look at life, how we live, and how we approach life. And because Jesus came, he lived and he died according to the will of God, and he lives again. He was indeed born as king. He was born as king, as the scripture reminds us. And why is it you think that Jesus drew such crowds? Why is it that people were drawn to him? As you look at the life of Jesus, I think what you will find is that people were drawn to Jesus because Jesus came to the outcast. He came to the lonely. He came to sinners. He came to the poor. He was a king like none other. He comes to the heartbreak of human suffering and our troubles to be a different kind of king, to be a king that reigns within the hearts of those who embrace him as Savior and Lord. So there is good news for the broken. There is good news for the troubled. There is good news for those whose hearts are breaking. There is good news for the fearful. There is good news for sinners and that there is indeed a Savior who is King. And so you think about all that uh, Jesus was and then those who follow Him go where the broken are. I think of so many today today particularly and, and throughout these last few weeks and the coming weeks who, who are ministering with their skill and their profession in health care, first responders, those who are giving of themselves, who are going where many of us cannot. Hospitals are built, were built and have been built in history in His name. The orphans have been cared for in the name of Christ. So many, so many go into areas where there's suffering or where there's devastation. Why do they do so? Because their Savior did. And they go to, to provide healing and hope and comfort and care. And we need to pray for folks, particularly during this time, who are on these front lines with this COVID-19. So Jesus shows up where they're suffering. I want you to think about His birth for just a minute. We find that Jesus indeed was born as a king. The gospel, the gospel reminds us of that in the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. The angel came to Mary, and this is what he said to Mary. Then the angel said to her, he said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son... And shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. I want you to think of the promise. Think about how Jesus came. Most kings ascend to a throne. Most kings will ascend to greatness. Most kings will grasp for power. Most kings will endeavor and work 
And here is a king who leaves the throne of glory. And he comes to us, and he comes, and as the Gospel of John says, he pitches his tent. He dwells among us. He comes to where we are. He leaves the throne of glory. Where the angels are declaring, holy, holy, holy. He leaves the perfection of heaven. And in great, and in great mercy, He comes and He's born as a child. And he grows. He increases in stature. He increases in knowledge. He increases. And we find Jesus who comes in humility. Not in, not in the prince's palace. Not in, in, the, in the halls of government or power. But Jesus comes... And he's born in a little town, a little village of obscurity called Bethlehem. And there as Mary delivered him, the Bible says that she wrapped him with swaddling clothes. It was the rags that were used in the care of the animals. But I want you to know as she was wrapping her baby that he was wrapped with all the truth of all the law and the prophets that had been given up to that point in time. Heaven touched earth with the reality that indeed a king was born and he was sought out. He was sought out by the three wise men. He was sought out by the wise men, we should say, the magi. There was, may have been several of them. But they were seeking him out. And even as a child, even as a baby, Herod found him threatening. Threatening to his throne and his power. But Jesus came for a different kingdom. Jesus came to do a different work. He came to... He came to to, to this earth in humility and in obscurity. Born a king. Indeed, born a king. And the power and reality of his life was that what was wrapped up in this, in this child was the reality of what thus saith the Lord of all of those years through the prophets and now He's living. He is indeed the living Word of God. But He comes like none other. John says that He comes to dwell among us. And I want you to think of that. What does that mean? He comes to where we are. You know, He left the throne of glory. The reality of heaven, there's no sin Suffering, death, tears. And in great mercy and in great grace, He comes and He comes, God in the flesh, to show us the reality of the love of the Father. Why did He do that? He did that out of great love. He did that out of great mercy. And then Jesus, as Jesus grew up to be, a, to be trained in a carpenter's shop, He came with a great mission, and His mission was to do His Father's business. Yes, this, this king was born as a child, very much human, 100% human, as well as 100% God. And He grows. One day Jesus comes to the temple. And it was His opportunity to read the Scripture in the temple, and, and Jesus reads from the prophet Isaiah. 
In the Gospel of Luke, the historian Luke, the physician Luke tells us about Jesus. And here's what he says about him. Because this is the king who comes and he seeks for the broken. He seeks for those who are heartbroken, who are those who are captive, to those who are indeed sick in the soul with the reality of sin and transgression. And so he comes and he reads these verses. He says this, As Jesus was handed the book, he opened it to the prophet Isaiah and he read these words. He found the place where it was written and he said this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of the sight of the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then the Bible says, Luke says it this way, he says he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And all the eyes were upon him in the synagogue that day. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Oh, my friend, Jesus comes to seek and to save the lost. And what breaks our heart breaks his. You think, he didn't have to do that. But why did he? Because of the will of the Father and because of a great love that you and I cannot even begin to scratch the surface of. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And so we look at the life of Jesus, the magnetism of Jesus' life, and people were drawn to Him. I think of a woman who, whose heart was broken relationship after relationship after relationship of trying to fill the void of love in her heart, and she had looked to everywhere. And Jesus meets her one day at a well. Her heart was broken. No doubt this woman had asked why over and over and over in her life. Her heart was broken and broken and broken until she met the one with a healing salve and a healing balm. Jesus talks to her. Most people shunned her. She was a Samaritan woman. And Jesus talks to her and he, he tells her that there's living water and a well that never runs dry. She recognized him as the Messiah and she embraced him as the Messiah. And then she goes and tells everybody. I think of Mary Magdalene. Her life was tormented. Heartache after heartache and the captivity of her heart was filled with the reality of something that had a grip on her that she could not release until Jesus. Until Jesus came to the depths of her heart, met her at the deepest point of her heart need, and there she found herself freed from the sin that captivated her. She had a new way of life and living. Why? Because she met the King. Jesus comes to those who are hungry. He looked out at the crowds of people as they were as sheep without a shepherd, and Jesus' heart was filled with so much compassion and love. The Bible says that he had pity. He loved them. 
He taught them as a shepherd. He taught them about the reality of God. He enlightened their hearts and their minds to the reality of who the Father really was. And then I think there was of another story in the Scripture. In the New Testament, we find there was a demoniac who, who dwelt among the tombs. People avoided those places. But Jesus went to that tomb one day, and a man who was possessed with demons was freed by the reality and the power of Christ. Why? Because Jesus meets us and He meets people at the deepest point of our needs. He comes to us right where we are. He doesn't cast us aside. And if Jesus is out to steal anything, it is to steal our heart that is captivated, so captivated with ourselves, so captivated with our own lives, so captivated with our own sin that we think brings us pleasure or enjoyments. And He comes to where we are and finds and, and allows us to know the reality of forgiveness. There is no king like King Jesus. And I just wonder, if, are you trusting in Him? He knows your fears. He knows your tears. Jesus is indeed touched with the feelings of your weaknesses and your infirmities and, and the things that plague your mind. You, can, you have the joy of meeting Jesus right in your home. He is indeed standing at the door and knocking to come into your home and into your life and to be the king of your heart. So this last week of Jesus' life, we see Jesus, we see Jesus riding in on a donkey. Now, most great political leaders during this day in the Roman Empire particularly would have been riding in on a stallion. They would have been making a grand entrance. But Jesus rides in on a donkey to say that his kingdom was not one for the grabbing of power, but it was the one of the giving of peace. Jesus came to bring peace. And indeed, He, as Isaiah said, is the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. So He's a King of Peace who is worthy of worship. And that's exactly what we see on this day. Jesus rides into town. I want you to think of, of the entourage and the great people, uh, the, the multitude of people that were surrounding him. I can imagine these people were the people that Jesus had ministered to out in, the, out, out in the field and out in the wilderness and out in the villages. The blind had, had, had their eyes restored. The lepers who were untouchable had been touched by this man, had been touched by the reality, the power of his life. And maybe they perhaps made that a part of that great multitude. There were, there were others there that, uh, that, that he had, had touched with their hearing. There were indeed others who had, like I'm thinking, you, you can think of like Levi, the tax collector, who had everything that he wanted, but not what he needed the most. And that was a relationship of, with God and the reality of a, of, a, of, a, of a new lease in his life that he tried it all, perhaps. And Jesus captured his heart. So there was, there was many that were surrounding Jesus in this day. The Prince of Peace had, had, was coming into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He was riding on a donkey. And the people did what they, uh, they, they, they laid their clothes, coats down, their outer garments down for the donkey to ride over. It was, it was a way of worship. 
And many of the religious leaders of that day looked and they said, he can't, Jesus can't do this. And they began to, 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 to mumble among themselves and to talk among themselves. He's receiving worship. He indeed is receiving worship because this Jesus who was riding in on the donkey, mind you, is the same Jesus that the angels cry out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. How could they miss the reality of what all the prophets had said? And yet they did. Like you and I oftentimes miss the reality of what God wants to do in our lives. We miss the reality. But this king comes in peace. There's no other king that speaks like this king. And he said, who is he? Who is he? Who is he that the winds and waves obey? Who is he who speaks like this, who speaks with authority, who speaks with healing, who gives hope? Who is this? Who is this? In the words of Handel, who is this king of glory, the Lord, strong and mighty? The greatest question that you can ask is, who is Jesus? Matter of fact, the greatest minds of intellect have to ask the question, who is Jesus? Was He a mere human human being who simply died a martyr, or was He more? Was the reality of His life, His death, an historical accounting of of a resurrection, it sure doesn't read like mythology. It reads like history, because it is. And that was the very gospel message that, that those who even denied Him, like Peter, did not even knew Him. who came to recognize that He was indeed precious. He is the precious Christ. He is the precious Christ. So we see Jesus in the the Passion Week. And then on Thursday we find Him gathering for Passover in the upper room. And there He breaks bread and He's celebrating what... Many of the Jews were there in Jerusalem to celebrate, and that was Passover. And Jesus instituted what we would call the Lord's Supper. And He reminds that there would be a new covenant, a covenant where His body, of His body that will be broken, and the blood, His blood that will be shed. Jesus knew the reality that the cross was right around the corner. Then Jesus girds Himself... with an apron, and with a basin of water, he washes his disciples' feet to remind us the reality of humility before God and to remind us of our need for cleansing. (coughs) And the power of Jesus. And then we find Jesus going to a lonely garden. He had been alone many times with with the Father, But this night was different. There was great anguish of heart. The Bible says that his sweat became as great drops of blood. His heart was breaking. The heart of the God man, the garden. And Jesus prayed, he says, Lord, if, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Jesus was immediately arrested after that, and then he was bought, brought before a trial. For Pilate said, they say you're a king. He said, what do you say for yourself? Open not his mouth. You say that I'm a king. That was the purpose that I came. 
but he's a king like no other kingdom. A kingdom that would reign in the hearts of men, the lives of men, the reality of the power of the living Christ who come to do the will of the Father. And then Jesus was mocked and scorned as a king. The crown for this king was a crown of thorns. crown of thorns. A reminder that in this world you will have trouble, there will be trials, there will be, there will be the reality of suffering that no one is exempt from. But the reality that God in the flesh walks in the reality of our own brokenness. Then the way of the Via Dolorosa. Jesus carries His cross to the place of the skull. The Bible reminds us that it was on that Good Friday that darkness covered the land. As Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth. Why? 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 The multitude that had just declared the reality and worshipped Him as God and Messiah, or as Messiah indeed, now their faint of noise of the crowd is saying, crucify Him. Why? In the will of God. As a mystery, Jesus, the inscription upon his cross. This is the king. He was indeed the king. Then Jesus hangs his head and he dies. He says, It is finished. What was finished? My friend, what was finished? What was finished was the reality that your sins can be forgiven and your heart can be healed. That there can be healing in your brokenness Because there was a Savior who was broken for you. If you ever wonder where God is, He comes for the broken. He comes for the broken. Most of us would be bothered to think that Jesus didn't have a burial plot. His body was taken down from the cross, prepared with spices, and buried. The tomb was sealed. And what we find is that Jesus truly died. There was not a resuscitation. He died. And the tomb that he was in was a borrowed tomb because Jesus had no intention of staying there. The power of Christianity and the power of the cross and the power of the message of the Passion Week is the reality that Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he said, because I live, you shall live also. He is indeed king. The youngest of the disciples, 
was one by the name of John. And we have the writing of the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then we have an accounting of John who had been exiled on an isle, on an island called Patmos. And in the book of the Revelation, we find the consummation of all things. We find the consummation, and we find where history is going. You say, this world is chaotic. No, this world, I like what Robert Morgan says, this world is not headed toward, it's not in chaos, it's going toward consummation. Why? Because it is still His story. So weeping endures for the night brokenness, the reality of our own heart need still exists. Struggle still present. But as the Old Testament prophets looked through an eye of faith to the coming of Christ, we look by an eye of faith back to the cross. And we look with an eye of faith to recognize that Jesus will indeed come again. And that is the promise that he gave to John. Matter of fact, that was the promise that he gave his disciples. That as he was going away, that he would come again in like manner. And then Jesus transports John to get a, a glimpse of life and reality from heaven's perspective. In Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 verses 78 and, and 8 says this, Behold, He is coming with clouds. And every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And then Jesus said these words, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The reality, my friend, is this. History is going somewhere. And it will come in the culmination of Jesus Christ. And you say, but Greg, how about me and how about now? There's great news. This king who was born a child, this king who came in peace, this king who was worthy of worship and praise, this king who comes to seek and save the lost, this king who comes to where we are is near us. So James says it this way, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He is indeed the sympathizing Savior. If you're listening this morning and your heart is breaking or broken, and you say, but I, I don't feel that God is near me. I'm not even sure He hears me. Rest assured, my friend, the compassionate Christ will meet you at the deepest point of your need if it's need for salvation, if it's need for healing in your heart, if it's, need, if it's in need of a Savior, we all need a Savior. It comes as we recognize our sin. It comes as we trust Jesus as Savior and Lord and embrace Him. And as many as receive Him, He gives the power and the right to become children of God. Right where you're at, you can open your heart to receive Him. 
Maybe your life is plagued with so many fears and so many troubles. And in this day and, and the time that we're in even now, our mind is riddled with perplexity and our hearts are filled with anxiety. But you can cast your care on the Lord who cares for you. And I want to encourage you to trust Him. So would you pray as I pray? And maybe it's to receive Christ. Then do that. It, maybe it's to, re, to lay your burdens over on Him. To say, Lord, you know. And to reaffirm who you're trusting in. Father, I thank you for everyone listening this morning. And I simply ask, Lord Jesus, for those who have in their brokenness recognize their need for a Savior, the rescue of their heart, and forgiveness. I pray that you'd give them faith and trust to know that you receive them right where they are. I pray that they would trust you today. I pray for others, Lord, who are listening and their hearts are feared with fears, anxieties. It is indeed troubling times, but you remind us to be of good cheer. In this world, we will have troubles. But you have overcome the world. Father, I pray that you'd give each of us trust and faith. That we may indeed lean on the Good Shepherd with ourselves. This King of glory who is to come, we rest in you and the security of who you are. In Christ we pray. Amen.